Thank you to everyone that has joined today's webinar. Um, my name is Sarah Miller. I am our Director of Partnerships here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and I'm really excited to be welcomed by Ariana Longley, our Chief Operating Officer. Um, today's webinar presentation will be about being, how to be safe in the hospital, learning how. So with that said, can we go to the agenda? Perfect. So today's agenda will we'll give a really brief overview of who we are here at the foundation. Um, we'll discuss your safety in the hospital, um, some of the free resources that we have, um, some COVID-19 resources, and then at the very end, we will have a question and answer session. For those of you that have joined, you have been muted upon entry. You will not be able to unmute yourself. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, there is a little chat button on the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and at the end, you can also submit your questions in the Q&A section that is live. I will be monitoring that and I will read those questions at the very end of this presentation. So with that said, I will pass it over to Ariana. Thanks, Sarah, and welcome everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, so before, um, let's see, let's, there we go. So before we get into who we are as an organization, I'd like to start off with uh, a video. Um, I will say that the video does contain some graphic images and it might be upsetting to some people. So um, if you think that you might be squeamish, um, you can come back in about five minutes um, when the video is over. So with that said, I'd like to start off with this patient story and then we'll get into who we are as an organization. Just as the nurse was about to put padding that was over my incision, my mother said, wait a minute, there's something on her stomach. Looked like a mole. And my mother asked the nurse to call the doctor to come back, and uh, she didn't want to. She said, I am not going to call the doctor for what's going to turn out to be nothing. My mother said, I'll call the doctor. I'll never forget, I was looking at my doctor, and I raised the gauze, and I just saw his face completely change. And when I looked down at my abdomen, the black dot was gone and there was a quarter size pustule. The infection kept spreading and it was starting to go down my leg. Over 2 million patients a year get hospital acquired infections. I ended up having six more surgeries, nine blood transfusions, I left the hospital with an open abdomen that took three years to close. My hospital, they were cited for being in violation of five state laws and 10 federal laws for unsanitary conditions in their operating rooms. It took me 10 years of almost weekly physical therapy to get back to a new normal life. I spent this past year, 2017, fighting for my life all over again. I went to the hospital with a sinus infection and they said, okay, we're going to keep you because it looks like you're starting to be in the early stages of sepsis. Well, the next morning, the infectious disease doctor came and he said, oh, great news. We're gonna send you home. And I said, really? And he said, you know my history. I said, I'm a survivor of sepsis, pseudomonas, MRSA, VRE, and necrotizing fasciitis. Can we wait until my labs come back before you discharge me? And you know, I'd like to see what some of the cultures are saying. And he goes, oh, we didn't, we didn't do any cultures. We don't need that. And you know, we did a test for pneumonia and influenza, and you're fine. You don't have those. So we're going to go ahead and let you go home. And I said, well, can I get a second opinion on that? Can we talk to someone about that? And he said, I'm the best infectious disease doctor in the Valley, probably the state. Any other doctor is going to tell you the same thing I'm telling you. I ended up having two more surgeries, two more blood transfusions, deep vein thrombosis, blood clots in both arms. I was right back where I was five years before and it just it really cemented for me the need to change the way we teach doctors the way we treat doctors 
the way they interact with patients and patients interact with them. We need to start sharing patient experience with our medical students, with our nursing students, so that they can get it from the horse's mouth. When you're building your, your house, your profession, you want to make sure that you build it on a solid foundation of patient safety. It's a major reason why we've seen 50,000 fewer preventable patient deaths in hospitals. And if you want to know what that means, ask uh, Alicia Cole, who suffers the long-term effects of a hospital-acquired infection. You know, we've learned a lot in healthcare, and we're better than we were 10 years ago. We're doing great at talking about patient-centered care. We're doing great at talking about preventing errors. We've got to do better in the action of it. So Alicia is so wise. Alicia sits on our board of directors. And every time I watch this video, I learn a little something more. Um, it's a great example of someone who was very um, educated the second time around and still saw a lot of challenges. So I think it's a great reminder to, to all of us, whether you're attending from um, you know, a clinical role today, whether you're just someone who's a, a concerned citizen and, and heard about this from a friend or family member, um, or you're a patient or family member who is, um, who's experienced this kind of harm before. Um, there's so many kind of bits and pieces of that video that I think we can all relate to. Um, so let's go a little bit into who we are as an organization here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We have a very bold vision of achieving zero preventable patient harm and death across the globe by 2030. Um, for, for those of you who are new to our organization, we had a very bold and audacious goal of achieving zero uh, preventable death by 2020. And no, we didn't make it, but we heard from everyone who had been following us for the last eight or nine years that it was really important to keep that urgency, um, that, that we were an organization that helps kind of bring everyone together and say, this has to happen now. You know, One preventable patient death is one too many. Um, and so our mission, we've just revised it. So this might be new to people who've been following us for a while, but it's to urgently unify people and collectively improve patient safety across the globe. And so one of the ways that we can do that is by educating the public, educating people about how to be safe in the hospital. Um, our core competencies, I'll just go through these real quickly, is forging global relationships, partnerships, and collaboratives to actively promote change for patient safety. Second is to develop and disseminate patient safety education to governing bodies, healthcare professionals, students, patients, the fam families, and the public. So that's what we're here doing today. And three is also creating public demand for safe and highly reliable care. So we hope that as you learn a little bit today that, you, that you'll think, you know, how can I help create demand, um, whether it be locally or regionally, um, statewide or nationally, how can you help drive this mission that we have to make care safer and reliable um, for every patient who's receiving care? So moving into the second part of the presentation for today, uh, your safety in the hospital. Um, and first, I'm gonna provide you with some facts around patient safety and medical error. One other disclaimer, I am not a medical doctor. I am not a nurse. I do have a master of public health degree. So um, be kind to me in the questions and answers section. Um, if there's something that I can't answer uh, because I don't have experience, I will relay that to our clinical team and get back to you after uh, the fact. But just keep that in mind um, that this is from being absorbed in patient safety and medical error, working in this field for the last six years, um, we've, we've learned a lot and uh, wanna be able to share some of that information with you. So I think most, most people who probably are here will probably know this, but I don't wanna assume that medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States. The, there have been various articles that have been written, um, as you can see here from US News and World Report and CNBC. Um, there was an article that came out back in 2016 from Johns Hopkins that said that it was about 250,000 Americans were, um, were dying of medical errors. Now, I'm gonna put an asterisk here because we're still in the times of COVID. We know that 
here in the United States at the time of this presentation, where over 500,000 people have died in the United States, we know that COVID has moved up to number three. However, during any other normal year when there isn't a pandemic, medical error has been for the last you know, several years, the third leading cause of death. So I think that's important. Hopefully we're um, becoming vaccinated, having less infection, and hopefully next year we won't have to worry about the pandemic. Um, but it, it is a, a really significant cause of death behind heart disease and cancer. So I'm gonna show you just some headlines. These are from across the world. Um, showing you how, you know, medical errors has made it into some of the headlines. So this one says baby died in dad's arms after bungling hospital medics made five major mistakes. This was out of the UK. Um, shrouded in secrecy, a beloved Utah mother and grandmother died after having liposuction. Why do so, people, why do so few people know? Uh, medical error ends with teen's thumb replaced with toe. Um, not funny, but uh, quite, an, uh, quite a headline. And then the last one is ex-PDP goober aspirant um, dies in Lagos Hospital. And this was actually a 49-year-old businessman, uh, the son of a billionaire, po a politician, philanthropist, and he had liposuction and died of hypoxia. So this really is occurring everywhere across the world. So bringing this back to COVID as we still are in this world today, um, this was an article that was published um, last summer in August, and it says, as COVID-19 spread, the feds relaxed rules and hospitals tried to contain the outbreak, other infections may have risen. So, you know, we, we also have to consider that as COVID-19 and the pandemic has, um, you know, affected our health systems, it may have also led to other infections and other types of issues related to patient safety and medical error inside of the hospital. So this is something that, you know, again, as a current event that, that keeps lasting here, we have to be cognizant of um, and how that affects your, your care as you um, seek care in the hospital in the future. I, I do also want to note one other piece of information that has become much more, um, you know, in the news and highlighted and important this last year. And so this is an article also from last summer that says the safety of healthcare for ethnic minority patients um, was uh, much higher, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they were at a higher risk of patient safety events if, if those people were from minority groups. And so those are the events that could have or did result in harm to the patient compared to the mainstream population. So minority patients, minority populations are vulnerable here. And so it's really important for us to consider that as well um, as we're talking about the safety of, um, of patients and your safety in the hospital. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a poll that we conducted last year. So in April, right as everything was locking down, we wanted to take a look at how many people actually knew what medical errors or patient harm was. So we conducted a, a public awareness poll through a, a polling firm, and we found um, in the, uh, I have a little box over here, um, in the lighter orange color in the tangerine perhaps, um, you can see that if you pulled the, the two, uh, yes, I've heard a little and no, I haven't heard anything. So these are people who don't, you know, haven't heard uh, very much about medical error or patient injury. That's 91% of the people who were polled in, in our survey um, said that they had, had heard very little or nothing. That's a lot. So we're saying this is a, this is a huge issue, maybe third or fourth leading cause of death, yet 91% of people have heard little or nothing about it. We just repeated this poll in March of this year, so about a month earlier than we normally would have, and we heard that uh, that number had gone down, which is good, right? Hopefully, as we do work, as other organizations uh, that are involved in patient safety do work, we want to see that number drop. So it wasn't dramatic, but we did see that there had been a small decrease, and now 87.3% of people had said that they had heard very little or nothing about medical error and patient injuries. So that's why this is really important for us to educate you and for you to continue spreading the word about this issue, about medical error, about patient harm, and what we can do to actually prepare and in some ways solve some of these issues that we know how to. Um, so I wanted to provide uh, just a few examples. We talked about people saying that they knew very little or nothing about medical errors. So I am going to spend a few minutes here on this slide talking about what are medical errors. So a medical error is an unintentional, preventable, adverse event, whether or not it's evident or harmful to the patient and leads to unsafe care. 
Um, medical errors are most often made by health workers who mean well, but operate in a healthcare system lacking systems and processes that are highly reliable, like aviation, nuclear power, and oil. So I think this is really important. I think it's really easy for people to think, you know, nurse so-and-so forgot my medicine and now I want to blame her. However, why did nurse so-and-so miss that dose? Was it because she was distracted and she didn't have some mechanism to make sure that she came back to you? It's, it's very often almost, you know, a majority of the time it's the systems, these healthcare systems that are not highly reliable that lead to opportunities for mistakes to happen. Um, so some examples of medical errors, if uh, we want to just go through a few of those. So let's say your, your son tests positive for COVID-19 and is admitted to the hospital due to the lack of masks. Your son's caregiver isn't able to stop the spread of infection and is also infected. So that would be preventable, um, giving a COVID-19 example, right? Um, second would be maybe your grandmother goes into the hospital for a hip replacement, gets an infection at the site of her surgery, and dies five days later. This is preventable. Um, this is something that as people start hearing about this, they think, oh my gosh, yeah, that's right. My, my aunt went in for surgery and she got an infection and, and she died. They start understanding and hopefully you'll start to recognize are there are people in your lives that have been affected. Uh, third, so maybe your neighbor has an asthma attack during uh, allergy season, goes into the emergency department for relief. The medication they give to your neighbor is 10 times stronger than it should be and he dies. This is preventable. And then lastly, your brother is in a skateboarding accident, hits his head and becomes unconscious. In the hospital, they place a tube in his trachea and it becomes dislodged and he dies. This is also preventable. So these are just a few of the many, obviously, types of examples um, that we can offer to, to help you understand what a medical error might be. All right, so let's now talk about some tips. So those were some facts. Let's move into some tips, some tips to keep you safe in the hospital. So how can you prepare for your hospital stay? One would be to research your medical issues. Um, now, some of the, the clinicians who might be on the line might say, oh gosh, she's telling them to go to the web. However, it's a lot easier these days to you know, type into the search engine and kind of research your medical issues. Now, if you know that you have a certain type of medical issue, maybe it's been diagnosed, the web can be really helpful to help. You, know, you only have a few minutes in front of your doctor um, most of the time. So being able to search the web and, and find some additional details is helpful. Um, this also can be helpful if you have very specific symptoms and you wanna look them up and see, should I go to the doctor? Should I go to the ED? You know, how emergent is this problem? Second would be research your doctor. Um, so we aren't connected with healthgrades.com. It's just a, a website that I've found to be helpful and have recommended to people. Um, what you can do is if you go to healthgrades.com, you can type in the name of your physician or uh, specialist, whoever you'll be seeing, and they'll tell you a lot about that person. There are sometimes reviews from the public, um, but most often it'll have like what their credentials are um, and other helpful information. Um, if, you're, if you're having to search for a new doctor and you don't know who to pick, this can often times kind of help you sort through and figure out if you think that they're a right fit for your care. And lastly would be to research your hospital. So these are two tools, um, Medicare, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or also known as CMS. They have a great website called Hospital Compare. Um, so if you were to click on the first link, um, you can actually search by your zip code, which can be quite helpful for you to see how a hospital, you know, two hospitals in your same zip code or within 25 miles of your zip code might compare. Um, and then the Leapfrog Group is another nonprofit organization that takes that Medicare um, data, that, that hospital compare data, and layers on top of that a survey that they send out to hospitals in order to provide a, a grade. So you'll see um, sometimes hospitals will say, we're a leapfrog A hospital or we're a B hospital. And so this type of information can be particularly helpful if you're, um, let's say you are going in for a knee replacement or you're going in for cardiac surgery. There's sometimes very specific information through both of those tools that might be able to help you distinguish between whether you should go to hospital A or B based on your procedure and the outcomes of the patients who've gone in for a similar procedure. So again, very helpful information. There are other tools out there, um, but wanted to supply you, uh, you all with a few examples. So second um, would be no possible risks and alternatives to proposed treatment. So uh, the first thing to think about would be, you know, should I ask what kind of complications might you expect? 
expect if you're going in for a treatment. So um, I have here, right? Maybe maybe it's a blood clot. Maybe there there's a risk for you particularly of um, of having a blood clot after surgery. So th they might tell you, hey, this is what you're going to have to look out for if you are prone to blood clots. Second might be nausea, right? What kind of complications might you expect? Are they going to be really major, minor? What are you going to be thinking about? And then second would be what should you be concerned about? Um, same thing with uh, with blood clots there. Um, the second one is delirium. Um, they often in the hospital, if they're suspecting delirium, ask you to uh, draw a clock. And this is oftentimes what a clock might look like if someone is delirious. So just think about asking these two questions. What kind of complications might you expect from whatever you're going in for or what you're in the hospital for? And what should you be concerned about? They're going to be different. They, they won't be these four examples every single time. And then also ask, what is your discharge plan? I think often so many people are in the hospital, they just want to go home. They're, they're tired, they've been kept up all night by alarms, they just want to go home and they oftentimes think, it's fine, I don't, I don't really need to follow the discharge plan, I just want to get home and get back to my normal routine. And it's very important that uh, you'll be given perhaps new medications or have been swapped medications, you may have new, new types of um, uh, you know, um, therapies and things like that. Maybe you have physical therapy following it. So these are just some of the questions that you might want to consider um, ensuring that you have answers to before you leave. Uh, as a reminder, this presentation and resources will be posted following this um, webinar. So uh, if I am moving, you know, past some things and you're trying to take pictures or screenshots, um, they will be shared later. And also, um, as a reminder, you can also find uh, many of these resources on our website. Uh, this is a short URL for you. So it's patient.sm slash patient dash resources. All right, so let's also think about what you should bring with you to the hospital. So the first thing would be your medical records. And what does that mean? Um, it, it could be some digital version that you have, but it should probably in, incorporate and, um, and be some of these items here, if not all of them, if, you, if you're able. So your problem list. The problem list is like, what are the problems that you are currently experiencing that you wanna make sure that the care team understands? Second would be your chief complaint. Why are you in the hospital? Is it because you broke your leg? Um, the problem list might be that you have diabetes and asthma, but your chief complaint, why you're actually there is you broke your leg. Um, other medical problems and treatment, so, so same, here, uh, same thing here, right, De that you're diabetic, that you're anemic, that you have COPD, that you have allergies, um, what other medical problems and treatments might your care team um, need to know that would be important for them to be able to treat you properly. Um, other examples would be previous surgeries done or other related treatments. Um, what else might they need to know about you, again, to, to have a good picture of you, especially if you're going to a different hospital um, than you normally do. Um, if, you know, we do have electronic health records, a lot of that information is maintained if you're going to the same system every single time. But remember, it's always helpful to bring up those problem, the, the problem list, your chief complaints, and the other medical problems and treatments just to make sure that that person who's looking at you doesn't have to go through a million different tabs in the, the EHR to find all that information. Um, when we're talking about you know, previous surgeries and other related treatments, um, these should be kind of sub bullet points, but what was done, how did it go, did you have any complications, and how did you tolerate anesthesia are all really good questions to also try to answer and provide to your care team. Um, if you're gonna have to go under anesthesia and you've been under before and you had a bad reaction, always helpful to mention that they might be able to pull what kind of anesthesia they used and try to avoid that. Um, again, all that information, super, super helpful for someone who's gonna try to care for you and the whole team that's gonna try to care for you. The second thing that you should bring with you are your medications. So um, first and, and probably you know least, uh, uh, the, the easiest thing for you to do would be to bring your medication list. So the name of your medications, the dose and the frequency at which you take those medications. 
The second would be, if at all possible, if you can grab your actual medication bottles. I know that it might be an emergent situation and you've got to just jump in the back of an ambulance, but if you are able to, to go to the hospital, bring them in a baggie, a paper baggie, a plastic baggie, and say, this is what I have. Um, the reason that we say this is there's a process called medication reconciliation where the care team can reconcile all of the medications that you have. This is great for if you do have chronic conditions, perhaps like diabetes or cardiovascular problems. You might be, if you've seen other, you know, several doctors or many doctors, you might have two prescriptions that have different names that might be doing essentially the same thing. And it could be that you're taking you know, more than you need to, and, and one of those could be eliminated. So this is actually really helpful for the care team to help you with um, just simplifying what you have. Also, if they're planning on giving you any new medication, then there might be something that counteracts with it. Again, very, very helpful for them to have as much information as possible. Um, I have included a graphic from the World Health Organization. It's called the five moments for medication safety. And this can be really helpful as well for just your normal routine. If you just go and see your, your GP and they give you a medication, there's these five steps that you can consider around what questions to ask when you're starting a medication, when you're actually taking your medication, when you're adding a medication and already taking another one, um, reviewing your medication list and stopping your medication. Um, in a few slides, I'll talk about an app that the World Health Organization has created around these five moments for medication safety. Um, so I'll have another opportunity to talk about this a little bit more. All right, and the last, but definitely not the last thing that you should bring with you is an advocate. Um, I like to define what an advocate is first so people understand um, that an advocate is a supporter, a believer, a sponsor, a promoter, a campaigner, a backer, a spokesperson. So no matter what, um, what kind of uh, synonym you use, an advocate is supposed to be someone who's there to promote you, to back you, to be your spokesperson. And so an, ad an effective advocate is someone who is, has these three characteristics. It has to be someone that you trust, someone who's willing to take action on your behalf, and someone who works well with others. Now, I, I don't wanna be crass or um, overlook this, but remember, if you have, let's say a spouse or a brother or sister and, and someone really close to you, and they do not work well with others, they have a short fuse, perhaps have a temper, um, or, or even someone who is just kind of laid back and they're not gonna take action on your behalf, consider someone else. If it's if this person's your spouse and someone who would be kind of the, um, the uh, natural advocate for you, consider is there a neighbor who you know, you've been living next door to for 10 years who knows you really well and would be able to take action on your behalf? Just consider this, that an advocate that's effective really should have all three of these components. Now, I know that there are situations um, that you may not have a friend or family member who can go to the hospital with you. Maybe you've recently moved. Maybe, um, you know, people have passed away in your family and you just don't have someone to help you. There are other options. Um, there are options to hire an advocate. Uh, there are organizations that you can go on and find very specific advocates for for you to go into the hospital, for people to help you with medical billing, et cetera. And then another option is if you have a disability, you may actually have access to advocates through a center for independent living. This was actually um, a suggestion from one of the presentations that I did a few months ago that someone mentioned, hey, this is another option for people who may not have a friend or a family member to help um, to help them advocate. So just consider those things. Who, who would be on your kind of list to be your advocate and how do you make sure that everyone in your family or everyone around you knows to call that person if you get into trouble if you end up being in the hospital does everyone know who's going to be the most um, effective advocate for them and make sure that they show up and remember the most important thing of, of, about advocating is the best information about you always comes from you. So if you aren't unconscious, um, you know, you know you more than anyone else. So the, the, the information that you can provide is always going to be the most reliable. Um, an advocate is, is second best and, and equally important. 
All right, so some free resources now as we move into um, the latter part of the presentation, I'm gonna share with you some tips and tools to stay safe. Um, the first is Patient Aider, which is a, kind of a, a homegrown um, mobile app that we, through the, th through the um, volunteerism and thanks to Mary Michelli, um, she's a retired RN. She's the creator of Patient Aider and now continues to curate it. Um, Mary basically was a, a nurse who was really frustrated that patients didn't know how to navigate their hospital care. They didn't understand what some of the risks were, and she felt that if they just had this information that they, it might be easier for them to be patients and be partners in healthcare with their, their healthcare um, providers. So Mary designed this app, donated it to us very kindly uh, several years ago, and continues to work with us on um, the content. So the concept behind Patient Eater is you go to the first screen with the, the colored squares and you would say I'm at home preparing for the hospital you'd click that and then on the right hand side you see that um, there's a topic called airway and ventilators so this is an opportunity for a, either yourself if you know that you're going to be um, you know intubated that you're going to go through surgery you can learn a little bit about what it means when they put an airway in and if you're going to be on a ventilator what what that means it can also be very helpful for an advocate so if you're an advocate and they throw out a term um, in the hospital and you're not sure what it means patient aider has a set of um, i believe close to 50 different topics that help help kind of bring um, some of the the language in the hospital displaying the the terms down to um, the layperson level. So definitely recommend that you download that. It is free. It's on the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. Um, second uh, is all sorts of tools that we've found. Um, you know, we we haven't created everything on our own because there are so many amazing other resources out there. So this is just a series of different kind of um, toolkits that you can find. The one on the left, My Health Notebook, is from Johns Hopkins. Your Discharge Planning Checklist is from CMS. Um, you can see we have Campaign Zero and um, Consumers Advancing Patient Safety. All sorts of different resources that we've found have been sent to us. People have said, hey, this has been really helpful for us that you can download for free um, and, and bring with you or bring along uh, to the hospital. The second set of resources that are also on our website are checklists and kind of one pagers. So uh, the one that I wanna highlight first is actually the who's who in the hospital, which is on the right hand side. It can be very confusing for someone who hasn't spent a lot of time in a hospital to know like who is this person who's coming into my room and what is their role and what, what should they be doing? So um, there's a really helpful uh, checklist from the Empowered Patient Coalition that helps kind of define what are these types of people, what can you expect? This information is also in Patient Eater. Um, and anything from like post-operative pain management, um, what to do per to prepare for surgery, all sorts of checklists and guides, again, collected from all over the internet, all over um, our friends and, and friends of the movement uh, that we've put together on the patient.sm slash patient-resources webpage. I do want to mention a few other resources that we found that are very helpful. Um, one is from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, also known as AHRQ or ARC. So on the left-hand side, they have a mobile app. It's called Question Builder. It's really nice. You know, think about all the times that you've gone to the doctor and you've thought, oh man, I had three items and I, I've only remembered two and now I only have one minute left of my um, appointment before I have to go. Oh, man, and then you get in the car and you're like, oh, that was the question I wanted to ask my doctor. So Question Builder is that type of app where you can just type in um, all the questions that you have. It'll link it to your calendar and then you could open that while you're in the doctor's office and say, these are my five questions and that way you don't forget anything. Uh, the other mobile app was what I mentioned a little bit earlier and it's uh, created by the World Health Organization. I believe it was the first consumer focused uh, mobile app that the World Health Organization created and it's called WHO MedSafe. And it's those five moments for medication safety that I mentioned built into a mobile app. So it helps guide you through the five uh, moments for medication safety and helps you uh, perhaps if you're with your uh, doctor to show them, hey, I have these questions, um, and they can see it's from the World Health Organization and why you're asking it. 
So I do want to say there are many other resources I could probably have, you know, a two hour webinar just for other resources that are really, really neat nifty um, out there for free. Um, so we've just picked a few if you do have suggestions, um, and you you don't see them on our website, and you think it's something that other people would benefit from, please don't hesitate to to put it in the chat box or email us after the fact, and we'd be happy to add it on our website. All right, so moving into um, the next section of the webinar is COVID-19 resources. Um, so I'm gonna talk about information about the virus and vaccines. Now, I want to keep in mind that if you're watching this, uh, you know, this video on YouTube later, um, it is May of 2021. And so we know that as uh, time passes, things change, information changes, all sorts of things have happened in this last year. So um, at this point in time, visitation is still pretty limited in most hospitals. There, there are several hospitals that I've heard of that are opening up um, and allowing advocates to be at the bedside if they've shown that they've been um, COVID positive or have the vaccination. So keep that in mind that at this current point in time as you're listening uh, live and maybe listening on YouTube later, that, that it is still really important to consider that some places may not be open um, to allow someone to come in and advocate like they would have been able to pre-pandemic. Um, so just keep that in mind and find out what options by this time, May of 2021, they should know what options they can provide you um, as far as whether you can do any kind of tele um, communication with your loved one who's in the hospital. Um, or like I said, if you've been vaccinated fully, you can ask the question, is it, uh, are you, have you opened up so that I can now advocate at the bedside? Um, also think about knowing what your loved ones are, are wanting, the open about end of life discussions. Um, and you can also follow uh, the plan of care for um, home using virtual communication, as I mentioned. Um, one tool that we have built, which is on the right hand side of the screen, the hospital plan of care, this can be really helpful. Um, this is a tool that was created by our clinical team in order for you to, uh, to use this for, um, uh, for someone who might be in the hospital due to COVID. So you can fill in all of kind of the green areas there. All right, and COVID-19 vaccination tips. As we know, there are several vaccines that are now currently on the market. A lot of the American general public is getting vaccinated. We do have frequently updated, frequently asked questions on our website. Um, if you go to the link that's displayed below. And I do have a, just a snapshot of what that web page looks like. We have information about you know, how the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines work, you know, how effective are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Those are the ones that are currently available right now here in uh, March of 2021 and just other common um, questions. So uh, we've tried to pull everything together. And like I said, we frequently update that with new information as it's available. All right, so this is uh, the end of the presentation. So what can you do if you're listening today? One would be make a personal commitment to zero by registering on our website. Uh, we are an organization that is commitment based. We want people to take action and actually do something so we can achieve zero preventable deaths in, uh, and, and harm uh, across the globe by 2030. You can advocate for yourself and your loved ones based on the information that you learned today. You can share resources that help friends and family members um, that you've seen today. Make sure to go back to the, the URLs that we've provided and feel free to share those as widely as you would like. Speak up for yourself and your loved ones. I know that's very similar to advocating, but just know that you have a voice and, and we are moving as a healthcare system more towards having patients be partners in their care. Um, we're making great strides there and you do have a voice so you can always speak up. Participate in our next event, whether it be a virtual, web, veg, virtual webinar like this or an in-person event in the future. We would love to have you continue to be involved. And lastly, invite us to present this type of presentation at any clubs or schools or libraries that you might be connected to. Um, this, obviously, we used to do this in person. We would do it at Rotary Clubs and senior centers and libraries and things like that. Um, a lot of those have moved virtually. So if there is an opportunity for us to come into your world and uh, share this information. If you think it's helpful, we would love to. Um, so you can email us about that. So with that, um, the presentation has concluded. So I will uh, open it up to Q&A and pass it over to Sarah.
Thanks, Ariana. And thank you so much for providing us with that great information. I will kind of echo Ariana's um, presentation and just say that all of these resources that she referenced are on our website. We have a lot of different pages and we're constantly updating it. So again, if you have any suggestions for what might be missing, um, we'd love to hear from you and we'd love for you to email us those resources so that we can take a look and hopefully add those to our website for the public. Um, I will say that the Q&A session is open, um, so I will give it a few minutes to allow you all to submit your questions if you have any for Ariana and myself. And I did want to note in the meantime, we did receive a, quite a few resources um, from some of our attendees today. So I did want to acknowledge and thank you all. We will take a look at those um, and email you if we have any questions. Um, I do want to acknowledge, I just looked at the chat and I saw that um, uh, Lisa Maurice, I appreciate you commenting that uh, most people don't recognize the word medication as meaning their medicines. Um, and so it looks like there was some research done at MedStar on patient-centered medication safety. And so uh, I thought that that was very, very interesting. And we'll take a look at how we might be able to, um, to, to include this in the how to be safe in the hospital and make sure that people understand that medication means their medicine that they take every day. So thanks, Lisa. And thank you for all those resources that you sent us as well. Perfect. Well, if we don't have any questions, um, if you, for some reason, end this webinar today and, you know, have another question that you'd like to ask us, feel free to email us. Um, we're always available and we'll be sure to answer your question promptly. But um, if we don't have any questions, I'm happy to give you all about 20 minutes back to your day. Um, and I will just say thank you again, Ariana, for all of your great information. And we hope that this has been helpful for our larger group. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. Have a great day.